Daniel. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to turn there with me, we're going to spend our time in Daniel. We will not get through everything from Daniel tonight, so we will come back again next week and continue our journey on setting a historical context for the New Testament. I lost everything. I had worked on this for days, and I lost it all off my computer. So I had to start over from scratch the other day. So I've been working frantically all the way up until less than at 6.20. Are you ready? <laughs> I was like, okay. Computer happened. Oh, oh, so, you didn't really lose it. oh, I did lose it. It's gone. Oh. It's deleted. I don't know where it went, but it's gone. It went the way of all flesh as far as I know. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, I had some really cool charts and things like that, and uh, we will not have those. But I tried to recover from my mind as much <laughs> as I could recover and get down. So we are going to attempt to walk through some history. And if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> and again, we're trying to frame an intertestamental history, preparation for New Testament and all that's happening <clears throat> And so this middle period that we've talked about is called the 400 silent years as referred to before. And this really is that period that happens between the prediction of Elijah's coming in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Some connect 3.1 also to that, that prediction of Elijah's coming. Some see that John the Baptist was a partial fulfillment of Elijah's coming. Um, <clears throat> yet they're still looking to a future manifestation of an Elijah type and the spirit and power of Elijah as John came in the time of uh, we find in Revelation but from that period from Malachi 4 5 to the angelic announcement in Luke chapter 1 verse 11 through 20 of John's birth <clears throat> it's that period that's called the 400 silent years and all of that was in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ all of that was God's hand at work moving and directing world history and some of the things we'll talk about tonight, it's just, it just blows my mind. It, it just totally blows my mind. Even down to some of the little minute details we'll talk about with Alexander the Great and fulfillment prophecy from Ezekiel chapter 26. But all of this stuff was in preparation for the coming of Christ. So in the last several hundred years of Israel's canonical history and the subsequent 400-year interval, many significant political and religious developments occurred. Politically, we... We'll start to look at the Persian period, dating from 539 to 331 B.C. <clears throat> and there is an overlap of these periods in, in some sense, but the Greek period, we date from 331 to 143 B.C. Actually, it started before that with Philip of Macedon. We only give a little bit of consideration to Philip, but mainly we focus on Alexander because that's who Daniel focuses on. And, and Alexander, and what he accomplished, far surpassed the, the vision in his own father's mind, and, and even what his own father had uh, achieved. But under this Greek period, we're going to look at Alexander the Great. We'll look at the, the Ptolemies, which date from 321 to 198 B.C., and then the Seleucids from 198 to 143 B.C. Now, there are actually four generals that divided up Alexander's empire. The only two that we're concerned with are these two, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. They're the only ones who really, when we find the impact upon history, they had the greatest impact, especially Seleucids, because it is from this group that Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, rose up, as, as Daniel prophesies in chapter 8, and also we'll see in chapter 11, but he prophesied about his coming and the destruction, deterioration that he would bring with him. But he was aggressively trying to Hellenize the world. He was just following in the footsteps of Alexander. So when we come to the time of the New Testament, they're permeated by the Greek culture in so many different ways, in which we can say that the environment was controlled culturally by Greece and politically by Rome. And what Alexander accomplished, and even Antiochus, what he accomplished in spreading the Greek culture, the ramifications can be seen all the way through the New Testament history. Then we have the Hasmonean period, which is from 143 to 63 B.C., We'll look at that period next week along with the Roman period from 63 B.C. to New Testament. So we'll get into the Greek period. We won't look at the Ptolemies and Seleucids tonight, but we'll introduce that and come back next week and look at that. But some of the other developments during this period, we have the religious developments in the Gentile world. We have the Greco-Roman pantheon 
emperor worship, the mystery religions, other philosophies. We'll look at such as Plato and so on and his influence and others who fall in the footsteps. Now, I hesitate to put Gnosticism up here because actually Gnosticism came into full swing and full development much later. So some, when you, if you read works on Colossians and, and even John's writings, they would say that they are trying, trying to combat Gnosticism. But Gnosticism wasn't really in existence during that time. There were, we could say, seedlings of it in the thought of man at that time. So that's why I put it up here, but it did not come into full development until much later. So if you hear someone preaching on Colossians and they talk about Gnosticism, plug your ears to that part. <clears throat> so the religious developments in the Jewish world, we have the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians, the Zealots, and the Sanhedrin, the synagogue and the temple. All of these things developed and they started in the exile. In that 70-year period of captivity, many of these things started. Well, without the temple, without the priesthood being able to function like they did in Jerusalem when they were taken off to Babylon, well, then they had to have places to meet. They began to gather together, and out of that is going to come the development of the synagogue so that when we come to the time of Christ, the synagogue is a part of the way of life for the Jew. And there had to be so many Jewish men in a city for them to have a synagogue. So that's why when Paul goes to Philippi and he finds Lydia and they're out by the river, is because there wasn't enough Jewish men to establish a synagogue there according to Orthodox Judaism. And so therefore, they would find a place that was of nature, whether a mountain, a river, something like that, and they would use that as a place of gathering and worship. So all of these things are behind the scenes. So when we come to the New Testament, all this stuff is in full swing. So you have 70 years of captivity that starts this Orthodox Judaism to develop. It develops through the rest of the intertestamental period. When we have the coming of Christ, so much of this stuff is just permeated. And, and look at the development of everything. Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, Essenes, Herodians, Zealots, the Sanhedrin, all of this, right? Didn't exist in the early days. When we look at the nation of Israel, it's just the priests, Right? And the temple, and that was it. Now, all of a sudden, you have all these other kind of religious leaders who can speak authoritatively and direct the people and the lives of the people, and so on. So, the designation 400 silent years is true only in regard to the voice of God. In other words, there was no oral written revelation. In Jewish writings, they talk about the fact that the Spirit ceased to operate and to function, that he, was, he has departed from the people. There weren't any prophets speaking during this period. And that's why we refer to it as the 400 silent years. But those 400 years were not silent in the sense that we have no information about that period. We have a lot of information about this period. And that's the great thing about the, the Christian faith and, and all that we find in Scripture. It's backed by archaeology and history. It's rooted in history. If you read the Book of Mormon, all of the things that are talked about, peoples, locations, monies, all that stuff, there is no historical evidence for it at all. It's all fabricated. But the great thing about the Bible is none of it's fabricated. And so many have come to Christ in the process of trying to prove it wrong. So many things took place during those centuries are well documented, and those events affected the life in the times of the New Testament. So when we come to Daniel, we talked about the breakup of the book. We have the personal history of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. The prophetic plan for the Gentiles, 2, 1 through 7, 28. The prophetic plan for Israel, 8, 1 to 12, 13. And this section we're going to look at next week, and this is where we will see about the, the king in the north and the south and all that kind of stuff, and we'll start to answer some of those questions. But Daniel deals with a broad scope of, of, of prophecy covering so many periods. you got the Old Testament era in which he lived, going through the New Testament era all the way into the millennium. And we have the time of the Gentiles that was inaugurated with Nebuchadnezzar. It's affirmed by the dating of Zechariah's prophecy. Luke is the only gospel writer to refer to this time period. We have Paul make reference, similar reference to the filling up of the Gentiles in Romans. All of that is to happen in this period. And this period comes to a close with Israel's restoration in Revelation chapter 20. And that will begin at the millennium when Christ will reign for a thousand years here on earth. And so Daniel deals with a great deal of, of time span. Remember, when the prophets spoke, they spoke about their time. They talk about immediate future and then remote future, right? Looking all the way down and, and most of them looking towards the second coming of Christ. If we take this chart a little bit further, as we looked at, we have the rapture of the church coming before the seven years of tribulation, the second coming of Christ before the millennium, 
And then we have the new heaven, new earth, and, and that is our eschatology, at least mine, as far as, as we go. We've began to look at the different kingdoms referenced in Daniel with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome 1, and Rome 2. We will get through Greece this evening, or at least into that part. <clears throat> And then we have the kingdom of the Son of Man. But remember, the, 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 kingdom isn't, the kingdom isn't just relegated to the future only. We have present fulfillment in the sense that He reigns in our hearts now, but there is a literal consummation of the kingdom in His thousand-year reigns in the, in the future. <clears throat> so let's begin to look at Daniel, the prophetic vision of the four beasts, starting in chapter 7, verses 1 through 28. And so what I want to do is as I go through these prophecies, I, I have looked at I'm basically looking at them as periods. So we'll have the, the Persian period, or we'll start with the Babylonian period, then Persian period, then Greek period, and so on. And we'll walk through them that way as we walk through the prophecies. And we're not going to extend our, our scope all the way to the millennial because that's not our concern. My concern is just setting the, the historical context for New Testament. And all that stuff will have to wait for when I preach through Daniel sometime. So if we look at chapter 7, notice with me, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay in bed. And then he wrote the dream down, and he related the following summary of it. So here we have the vision that's recorded in this chapter. It's revealed in the first year of Belshazzar's reign, which was 553 B.C., when Belshazzar was made co-regent with Nabonidus, which was his father. There's a lot of... It's interesting. Nabonidus isn't talked about much in, as far as Scripture goes, but historically, there's a lot of stuff going on during this time, and it's fascinating that, that Nabonidus had already suffered some defeats by the hands of the Persians before they even came in and took over Babylon. So for the father, he saw the demise coming. Belshazzar didn't see it coming. All right, but it's, it's fascinating too historically what happened. But So what we have in chapter 7 actually happens earlier. It's just recorded later for us in Daniel's work as far as how he composed it for as far as the direction of the Holy Spirit. But Daniel's dream then predated by 14 years his experience in the lion's den, which occurred in chapter 6, which occurred soon in or soon around or soon after 539 B.C., and that's when the Persian came in and took over Babylon. So just after that is when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den and so on. So when the dream came, Daniel was about 68 years of age, since he was likely taken captive at the age of 16 52 years earlier in 605 B.C. Just think about that, 68 years old. And that's the thing that's hard for us sometimes when we go through these books is we, 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 we fail to realize that it's not recording all history that happens, right? So there's big blocks of time that aren't recorded. I mean, you can jump from one verse to the next and have, you know, 50 years covered in that time span. So we have to keep that in mind. What's staggering to me is he's 68, God was still powerfully using Daniel and his position, not only in the kingdom, but as a, as, a, as a prophet for the nation of Israel, explaining to them what God is doing and what God will do, right? I mean, bolstering the hopes of those who were held in captivity that, hey, listen, God's not done with us yet. And let me tell you what he's going to do with these world powers. So you're sitting there, the nation of Israel, and they're in exile, and, and they see all of this stuff happening on the world stage, and a lot of this stuff is going on, these world powers contending for who is going to be number one, and they're wondering what happened to us, right? I mean, you've got to imagine, they're sitting there going, well, when, are we ever going to, right? And so Daniel is going to help bolster their hopes and affirm that God is not done with them yet, but 68 years of age, still used by God, which means it's never over till it's over, right? The revelation was given to Daniel in a dream. Now notice the dream is in a singular, but then we have visions referenced here. So <clears throat> when we look at this, we understand then the dream being in singular emphasized the unity of the revelation, and the visions emphasize the successive stages in which this revelation is given to him. And if you look through the text over and over, we see the reference to I was looking or I kept looking, right? So the dream looks at the unity of the revelation. The visions look at the successive stages that he goes through. And, and obviously, I mean, we look at in chapter 8 even, he's, he's, he's taxed by what he is seeing. I mean, physically, 
it drains him. Physically, he's going through a lot of stuff. And even you had to imagine emotionally, he's going through a lot of stuff as all of this stuff is being revealed to him, right? We're talking about world history that no one knew was going to happen yet. All future. The great sea is referenced here. Notice with me in verse 2, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The great sea, if you look at any map, you will find that the Mediterranean is referred to as the Great Sea. So that's what we're talking about here. And it's used to represent nations and peoples as we find in chapter 7, verse 3, but also in verse 17. Notice with me, it says, These great beasts which were four in number are four kings who will rise from the earth. Earlier in verse 3, it talks about them arising out of the sea. So the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, is used as a representation of the Mediterranean world and the different peoples and nations and so on. And then these beasts are representing kingdoms that are now going to rise up in God's plan as He's going to raise them up and bring them down. The great thing about Daniel's prophecies is that, you know, the vision is given, the dream is given, but then there's the interpretation, and so it's all explained <clears throat> for the most part for us. There's still some stuff to think through, but for the most part, we're given clues as to what we're dealing with here. So the times of the Gentiles, this is what we're looking at, and as we walk through the different beasts, we go back to chapter 2, which also gave the similar revelation, similar prophecy in regards to the different nations. And so I made up this chart for you, and so we'll follow you. So Babylon is the head of gold in chapter 2, and it is the lion with the eagle's wings in chapter 7. And all of the excavations of Babylon in that region have found these statues of lions with wings. And so this was a representation of their kingdom. And oftentimes you will find the head of of one who looked like Nebuchadnezzar, so on the way that they adorn themselves and their beards and so on. But this is the first beast that we deal with, so this is the first kingdom that we're going to look at is Babylon. And this is the Babylonian Empire, to give you a sense of, of the, the vastness of it. And it was a world power at this time. But we'll see, it's interesting, as if you watch the maps as we go along, the different periods and the different kingdoms, it just keeps expanding to when you get to Rome. I mean, really... It was, they impacted, the, you know, it's reference to the inhabited world because that's how many saw it because it was such a massive empire. So we'll watch the progression as we walk through this, but we started with the Babylonian period, which ranges from 605 to 539 B.C., because we find that Belshazzar is explained the writing on the wall in chapter 5 of Daniel, right? And immediately that prophecy is fulfilled. So we have Judah continue to function as a single political entity until Babylonian influence began to be felt in Palestine. Immediately after Babylon conquered Egypt in the Second Battle of Carchemish, Judah came under the political dominion of Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C. And this was the first deportation, and this was going to be when Daniel was taken in captivity. Then there's the second one in which Ezekiel was going to be a part of that. Jehoiakim is left in control. He is going to be, he's going to rebel. He's going to be carried off to Babylon. His son Jehoiakim is going to take over. He's going to reign for three months. He's going to rebel. He's going to be taken captive in 597 BC along with his mother, his wives, his military consultants, soldiers, craftsmen, and Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 2. So all of them are going to be taken off in the second deportation. Then comes the destruction of Jerusalem and the final deportation in 586 BC. Now, it's interesting because Nebuchadnezzar is going to lay siege to Tyre in 585 B.C. And we'll talk about that in a little bit in regards to Alexander the Great because it is the first step in the fulfillment of a prophecy that Ezekiel gives in chapter 26. <clears throat> so this is the Babylonian Empire, the, the vastness of it. I mean, look how far-reaching it was coming all the way down past Jeru Jerusalem to Lachish and down to the borders of Egypt. So when we talk about these empires, these really were empires. Sometimes you get the impression, right, that, you know, they're just these little groups of peoples. But no, this is, this is a major empire at this time. And, and there's a lot that, that happens, and they sort of sweep over these other peoples and embrace them in, and they become a part of the empire and so on. And so lives are changed by this. Lives are changed by the way the political system works, because each conquering kingdom or empire that comes, they have their own ways of working. 
Some bring in all of their, their captives and bring them to the, 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 the main city, the, the capital, if you will, and, and keep them there so that they have them under control. It's like the old saying, right? Keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Others' empires, when they would conquer, they would scatter their peoples back to other regions and have them settle those areas. And so each time that you have one of these world forces coming in, life was, uh, you know, tossed into turmoil. We have Medo-Persia then, move on to Medo-Persia, which is the chest and arms of silver in chapter 2, the bear with three ribs and the teeth in chapter 7. And this is just a, a picture of what the empire looks like, but notice how much grander it is than, than the Babylonian empire. So the expanse of it heading out is going to increase as we move along. The Persian period is from 539 to 331 B.C., Where it impacts us is in Daniel chapter 5, and we have the reference to the fulfillment of the prophecy given. The writing on the wall, Daniel explains the writing on the wall and what's going to happen to Belshazzar. Then in verse 30, that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain, so Darius the Mede revived the kingdom, received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So this begins our Persian period, although the Persian Empire started long before this. The Jews came under the dominion of Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, when Cyrus conquered Babylon and Belshazzar, and he himself entered the city on October 29th, 539 B.C. Just think about that. This exact day, in 539 B.C., Cyrus entered into Babylon. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, I actually conquered it in, in October 16th, 539 B.C., but he himself then came in later. Now, how they conquered it was, <clears throat> so these cities, they would store up, major cities, they would store up supplies. There, there were likely supplies in Babylon that would last through 20 years if there was siege laid to the city. This happened often when you have conquering powers come in, and so they would prepare themselves. The other, the other thing that was interesting about Babylon was that they had a river that ran through the city, came in from the north and out through the south. So what Cyrus's army did was when they came, they took a group and they split themselves. One force went to the north, the other went to the south. And what they did was they diverted the water from the river, and they diverted it away from the city towards a nearby lake. What that did was diminish the water level in the river. So then they came in from the north and then from the south underneath the sleuth gate and entered the city. There were no guards in the walls because they figured this is a, this is a solidified fortress. There's no way anyone's going to get in here. But they didn't even feel like they needed guards on the walls. So while they're partying and living it up, the troops are coming in on the sleuth gates and they enter into the city and they take it over in no time at all. Then Cyrus is going to come himself in the 29th of 539 B.C., and he's going to enter the city, and that will be now his place of rule. Cyrus, who ruled from 550 to 530 B.C., once was a king of Anshan, a tributary of Medea. He rose to power with his conquest of Medea, and then he took control of Assyria, Mesopotamia, Armenia, Cappadocia, and then later he defeated Lydia, took Greek Asia Minor and moved eastward, taking six other regions, major regions, and he took control of them. So his rule started earlier than 539 B.C., but nonetheless his world impact in the empire was felt at that time, especially when now you take over Babylon, who was the number one empire. So Cyrus was making himself a, a dynasty, if you will. So here is the Persian Empire by the time that, that Cyrus and, and the others had, had made their impact upon the world. This is the vastness of the empire and the reaches of it. Alexander is going to build upon that. The Jews found in Cyrus a kind of benefactor issuing a decree allowing exiles to return for the express purpose of rebuilding the temple. We find this in Ezra chapter 1 verses 4 through chapter 4 under leadership of Zerubbabel. And this was the first return, 538 B.C. So there were three ways of deportation, three ways of return. This is the first return that happens. The last two returns are going to happen under Artaxerxes the first. The foundation of the temple was laid, but because of external opposition, the work was interrupted and labor ceased for about 15 years. They became preoccupied with their own houses and all of that, and so God's going to raise up prophets like Haggai and Zechariah to come in and to get them back on track. <clears throat> But it's interesting because during this interval, Cyrus is going to die. 
and he's going to be replaced by Cambyses, who reigned from 530 to 522 BC, who murdered his brother Smyrtus, who was supposed to take the throne, and he killed him, and he took over the throne. Now, it's interesting because Cambyses is then, he's going to head towards Egypt. He's going to defeat Egypt. He's going to head into Ethiopia, but he's going to hear about a usurper that has put himself upon the throne, and this usurper is referred to as pseudo Smyrtus. And so he is going to hear about this, and he is going to turn himself back home towards home. But on the way, he's going to die. So on the way back home, Cambyses dies as he returns to home. His military is going to go the rest of the way home. They're going to take this pseudo smyrtus they're going to kill him, and then they're going to put Darius I upon the throne. And this is Darius I, Hestapes, which he reigned from 521 to 486 B.C. Under the leadership of Haggai, Zechariah, and Zerubbabel, the people returned to the construction of the temple. They finally completed in about 515, 516. And then when the provincial governors questioned their actions, the Jews appealed to Darius, who honored the decree of Cyrus, and even subsidized the work with government funds. I mean, that to me is amazing, right? I mean, here you have this foreign power, and what do they care? But God had already prophesied in his Isaiah that he was going to be right, used. Cyrus and others were going to be used. And so here you have Darius who reads the law and says, okay, there's a decree that was given by Cyrus. I need to honor that because that's just the way that they, the government functioned. And he's going to go and pay for that, which is amazing. When you think of the, the, so often in, in life when we have needs and we sit there and think, okay, God can fill this need this way, this way, this way, this way. There's so many ways in which he blows my mind and how he does it. I mean, I just think over the last few years how he has provided for things, and there is no way I could have ever calculated that would have happened. No way. So here he's going to use his foreign power to help them to build the temple. Now this is interesting because Darius, I mean, he, was, he was known. These are some of the sites from the Persian Empire engravings that we have left for us. Recorded history in rock, Right? immovable. So you can go to these places and see the residue of the Persian Empire, but especially with Darius. Darius wanted to solidify his reign. He was put on the throne by the army of Cambyses. He wanted to solidify his, his reign upon the throne, so he defeated nine different kings in 19 different battles, making sure that he was not being, going to be contested by anyone. And here we have this engraving upon the rock that refers to this period with Darius and what he accomplished. So this is Darius, and these are the kings that he conquered to establish himself very solidly upon the throne. Not only that, but we also have, I mean, if you can look, you can see a semblance of writing above and below, but all around here is cuneiform writing. And there was trilateral, there are three different languages that, that were represented on this monument that Darius had established. The first was Old Persian, the other was Akkadian, and the last was Elamite. This, the, which was referred to as the Behistun stone, was used in deciphering the cuneiform script. There's only three writing systems in all the world. I mean, imagine that. Three writing systems. All languages, there's only three. One is the cuneiform, the other one is Egyptian, which is where our writing system came from. And then the last is Chinese. All of them started off as pictograms. The only one that developed into an alphabet was the Egyptian. And the Greeks did this. They took a syllabary over from the Phoenicians. They, they refined it to an alphabet. And they passed it on to the, to, to the Greeks, Etruscans, and so on. And then finally to us. So this monument, anyone can go. And, and it's been a place of great study. But here we have reflected the cuneiform, uh, this is just amazing, right? And all of this tells about what Darius did. And there's just ma major, massive sections that are attributed to the move of Darius and all he accomplished. So Darius politically was ambitious. He moved against Thrace and Macedonia, and this is important because this sets the stage for Greece, which we will look at next. He also went up against the Scythians. He was defeated by the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon, which, yes, that's where we get Marathon from, right? The runner is sent back to report news of, a bat of the battle, right? And he ran the exact distance that a marathon is today, and that's where it was established. And he did drop dead at the moment that he arrived. <clears throat> 
So he was defeated by the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon. He retreated to the mainland. The battle was significant because it produced the first major encounter between East and West, the Persian Empire, and the Greek city-states. Now, this is important. Greek city-states, they, they weren't united yet. Okay? Alexander's going to do this, but his father's going to start the process. His successor was Xerxes I, 486 to 464 B.C. Who was Xerxes? He is a Hasuerus, oh, yeah. Esther's husband. Yeah. Think about this now. Xerxes was his Greek name. Ahasuerus was his Hebrew name. I'm not even going to tell you what his Persian name was, but this is Esther's husband. This is amazing, right? This is amazing stuff. After putting down rebellions of Babylon, Egypt, he moved against Greece and took Athens. His fleet was defeated at the Battle of Salamis, and he retreating, leaving the Greeks in control of their own land. But that set the stage for what was to come. Because Xerxes did this, this is part of the reason why Alexander turned his direction towards the Persian Empire. He wanted to make them pay. And there's no better way to get the Greek people to rally behind him is if we go against our arch enemies, the Persian Empire, and pay them back for when they came in and did this to us. And that's how he was going to use to build his army. Under the reign of Artaxerxes I from 464 to 423 B.C., we have the final returns of exiles in 458 B.C. and 445 B.C. Now you have Artaxerxes I. This is just for free on the side. After Artaxerxes I, you have Darius II. You have Artaxerxes II and the third, And then you have Assares. And then you have Darius III. And that is the finishing of the Persian Empire. Darius III is the final one. His reign ends in 331 B.C. So there is overlap between the Persian Empire and the, and the Grecian Empire. Am I moving too quick for you? Um, where did you get this information? <laughs> History books. No, I mean, lots and lots of history books. This week no. Okay. No. Over time. Can you inform? Yes. Now, because they, 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 using the Behistun stone, they decipher the Kaneaform script so they can now read it. So they have linguists who go and will study it and can read the Kaneaform, which then now we can see other monuments. We have the Cyrus Cylinder and other things like that where we can go now and read them because we have an understanding of the script and how it works. So when you read that, that was chiseled out, I just happened to notice there was a lot of them that looked like uh, Roman numeral three. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's not, but um, gosh, there was a lot of them in there. Yeah. Each one, <clears throat> so each one, because it all started from a, a pictorial form, so when I did my, my introduction to language, uh, as I introed the Greek class, I did a history of written language, and I walked through the scope of it. But it's interesting because you watch from pictogram to, to even the cuneiform script, you can see the periods of transition to where it goes from just this picture to this symbol now, which cuneiform, it's a syllabary. You have a symbol that represents two, three letters, a syllable for us as we would understand it that still has remained the same. Chinese does the same thing. There are pictorial elements to language plus the, it's syllabary. But English is the only one that has a full alphabet. And then other languages like Russian and so on that borrow the same alphabet from the Greeks. <clears throat> this brings us to Greece. The belly and thighs of bronze, chapter 2, and then the beast-like leopard in chapter 7. So you can walk through these visions, if you will, on your own and read through them, and, and Daniel gives us the explanation, but just wanted to try and tie all this stuff together as far as the, the context for New Testament. But here's the, the Greek Empire, and, and again, notice the progression from Babylonian to the Medo-Persian to the Grecian. I mean, it's just far more expansive than the influence that Alexander had upon the peoples of the world as he sought to conquer them. It's staggering. I mean, the, the, the effects are still today. Greek period is from 331 B.C. to 143. 
Now, this period actually started before this with Philip of Macedon, which was Philip I. He, was, he laid the foundation for the Greek Empire. So here's how it started. So Philip had this vision to unite all the Grecian people. Now, what's interesting is that... <clears throat> all right, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of back history, all right? There were periods where the Grecian people would have conflicts. They would go to war, and they would have all these city-states. Now, historically, it is suggested that there were up to about 170 of these city-states of Grecian peoples. They had their own language, and there was a common element to all of them because they were Grecian, but they all had their own uniquenesses. It's, it's, and it's not unusual. Even if, so if you travel the U.S. and go to different parts of the U.S., people speak differently. We have different pronunciations of different words, right? Derby, Darby, Dabby, depending on where you go, we can have different pronunciations. Well, it's the same way with the Grecian people because they lived in these little pockets of communities isolated from others that they maintained some of their own distinct elements to language and even culture-wise. And so it was interesting because Les and I were reading about a missionary in India where he lived in India, it was so isolated by mountain ranges and the coast and that, that where he grew up, predominantly, most of the people there were believers. And so he grew up his whole life thinking that everyone in India was a believer like he was. Because there were so many Christians in this little pocket of people. They sustained themselves off of the ocean. That's how they fed themselves. And they would trade with others who would come from other places and so on. So they didn't interact with the rest of the people groups throughout India. So they had this idea that this is what we were all like. When he started reaching out into, into India, then he realized things are a lot different, mm -hmm. right? So this was the same thing with the Grecian people. Well, Philip decided to unite them all. This was the, the empire, but this is how it was fragmented. And again, it's historically, they suggested there was probably about 170 of these city-states. Now, some of them might have joined themselves together for other reasons. Enemies coming into a territory, a couple of them joined together to strengthen their forces, to fight against them and join. But all these things are, are as a study Greek, you'll find that all these are different Greek dialects within this one common language. So I love linguistics. There's so much cool stuff about it. But anyway, so Philip had this idea. You had a question? No, I was... Uh, so he wants all these Greek little bitty things to get together as one and, and go fight Persia. Persia. Yeah. The, Philip had the idea that he wanted to start his own kingdom. It goes back. All right, so this is where it started. Philip had a pretty powerful force, but in his own little region. Well, those who lived in Macedonia, okay, the Thracians who lived in the north, were pushing their way down into Macedonia. At that time, it was called the place of the springs of the fountains. So they reach out to Philip and ask him if he would come help drive the Thracians back out of their territory. So he does this, and he decides that he's going to make that his new capital. And this is where he gets the vision of unifying the Grecian people. There's plenty of gold, plenty of timber. And he decides, I'm going to make an empire for myself, and I'm going to unite all the peoples to do that. And he started the process, but he died early and never finished it. So he begins by, and, and that's where Philippi originally got its name from, was from Philip of Macedon. That was going to be his capital. He was going to establish his empire there and unite the peoples. He dies early, and his son now is going to rise up. His son was 19 years old. 19 years old, Alexander gets the vision from his dad and decides he's going to conquer the world. Just think about that now. I mean, how many of us at 19 were thinking about conquering the world? We were conquering other things, right? But not the world, right? He's going to conquer the world. And he was so zealous for the Greek culture. He wanted to permeate the world as he conquered it with the Greek culture. Now, what's fascinating is if you read historically, you will find that the golden age of Greek culture was right around the time of his father and Alexander. So it hit, if you will, its height in literature, art, and philosophy before Alexander went to conquer the world. This didn't just happen. This was God's design. 
You have Pericles, you have Herodotus, who is referred to as the father of history. You have Socrates and Plato and Aristotle wrote their masterpieces before Alexander even went to conquer the world or before his father even really started to unify everyone. And that set the stage. And all of a sudden, they're going to take this Greek culture and they're going to take it out into the world and give it to everybody. And that's what Alexander did. When he went to conquer the world, he took his historians, he took scientists, he took philosophers, and he took them with him and he wanted to permeate everybody with the Greek culture. He wanted to literally Hellenize the world. And this is what he attempted to do. He started the process. So when we read names like Simeon, which is Peter's name, it has Hellenistic influence. They were all influenced by it. Paul grew up with two names, right? Saul and Paul. Saul when he was interacting with Grecian people and Paul when he was interacting with Jews. Colossians chapter 4, we have Jesus who's also known as Justice. One name he uses when he's with Jews, the other he uses when he's interacting with, uh, with Grecianized people. This was the world in which Christ came. There was all this stuff. I mean, so often we think that this, just when Christ came, it was just like in a vacuum. There was nothing going on. It was everything going on. I mean, even in the thought world of man at the time with the great philosophers and their influence. I mean, Plato, right? I mean, thinking about the ideal is beyond the physical realm. Open the door for people to accept some of the ideas that Paul and others were going to teach. I mean, the foundation was set by God so long before, but Daniel prophesied this is going to happen. So upon the death of Philip of Macedon, his ambitious son Alexander takes over. He gets the vision at 19 years of age, he's going to go conquer the world. Alexander looked eastward to the vast territory controlled by the Greeks, ancient enemy, the Persians. Now, what's interesting is Alex to gain the people behind him. One of the things he did was, this was the secondary thing he did, was he said, I'm going to go after the Persians. We're going to pay them back for what Xerxes did. But he also used brute force to get them behind him. So there was a city of Thebes, a Grecian city Thebes, and they refused to submit themselves to the authority of Alexander. So he destroyed the city. From that point on, all the other city-states got together and said, let's join forces and whatever you need for your army. will." So they gave him soldiers and they sent him supplies and they said, we're behind you, you're our man, you are now our king. And then he says, okay, now we're gonna go after the Persians and that's what you're gonna do. And so he helps unite them and move that direction. So he's going to lead his army, he's going to cross the Hellespont, he's going to defeat the Persians at a strategic place, the Granicus River. <clears throat> and this starts the process right here. This is where he begins his journey to take over the world. It's conquer Persia first, and eventually he's going to make it through Babylon, he's going to go through Persia, but he, he wants more than that. He wants the culture, and again, this was because he had such a desire for the Greek culture, for everyone to experience it. The literature, the art, the philosophy, I mean, everything. He wanted everyone to know it. And the great thing is he brought the language with him. So you have all of these different city-states who have this, this basal element of, of, of commonality in the language, yet they all have their uniquenesses. Well, guess what happens? When you have an army that consolidates and combines together, you're going to consolidate and combine the language, and that's one of the things that happened. So that by the time that Christ comes... Greek is the language that everyone uses. Everyone spoke it. If an emperor wanted to send a message to the Roman Empire, he wrote it in Greek so that everyone could read it and understand it. Alexander did this. God did this. Right? He set the stage for his revelation to be written in Greek. And we'll talk about that in a moment. This victory opened up the entire region of Asian Minor to him. He encountered and defeated Persian armies at Issus, and then he moved southward, and he took Phoenicia, Palestine, and Egypt. Now, this is interesting. He passed through places like Sidon and Erebus. They, they, they surrendered. Hey, we're not going to fight you. They heard about him coming. They gave in. Tyre? Tyre said, look, we're Switzerland. We have nothing to do with this, this Greco-Persian conflict. And at that time, Tyre was, this is the second location of Tyre. The first location was on land. This is the second location of Tyre at the time when Alexander came. It was an, an island, a city island, and it was right off the coast. So they figured, hey, look, we've got water between us and the shoreline. No one's going to touch us. And, the, and Alexander wanted to come in. He, he said, I want to come in, and I want to sacrifice in your temple to the god Malkart. And, and they refused him. They said, look, we want any part of this. Just leave us alone, and we're out of this. 
That so enraged him for them declining to allow him to do that, that he laid siege to the city. Now here's what's fascinating, is he built what we call a mole, but it was a land bridge. So he took lumber from Lebanon, but he also took lumber and stones and stuff from the ancient site of Tyre. And he takes it, he has his men, seven months, they build a land bridge with this debris putting in the water till it finally rises high enough and they work their way to the island. Then he has two fleets of ships that come from other kings that he conquered on his way down and they're going to come in from the waterways and he's going to take Tyre. Now what's fascinating about the first siege of Tyre was laid in 585 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. It took him 13 years. 13 years he laid siege to Tyre and he destroyed it. Laid it to rubble. Ezekiel prophesied in chapter 26 that their stones and timbers and dust were going to be cast in the midst of the sea. Alexander fulfilled that prophecy. That's, just, that's the amazing thing about God. He says he's going to do something and he never forgets. And you could be years away and, and you know, empires pass and go. And then all of a sudden it's like, now's the time for me to fulfill what I said I was going to do. So Alexander, he lays siege to Tyre, and he takes it over, and he's going to keep moving. He's going to head, and this is interesting, a little side note, and Josephus writes about this. Tradition says that he spared the city of Jerusalem because of Jadua, the high priest, who showed him from the prophecy of Daniel that he was going to conquer Persia. So it's suggested that that's why he didn't, you know, sack Jerusalem. Don't know if this is true or not. It's just Jewish tradition. However, the fact remains, he didn't destroy Jerusalem, but he destroyed all these other cities that he conquered. So do what you will with that, but it's just a fascinating piece of, uh, of history or tradition that we have passed down to us from Josephus. He finally pushed his way through Babylon and Persia, made his way all the way to India before heading back home to Greece. He literally at that time conquered the world, and he died as he headed back home at the age of 33, but this is all that he accomplished. He set up strongholds all the way through this empire. The problem was is that he was not going to leave behind one single individual to sit upon the throne to keep it united. This is amazing that God uses him to do all of this stuff to, to bring the culture but the language and everything to set the stage and then pfft, he's gone. At the age of 33, in 323 B.C., he dies. This is why we have the reference in chapter 8. We have the, the, <clears throat> the male goat, and he's moving so swiftly his feet don't touch the ground. That was the lightning speed which Alexander conquered the world. <laughs> no, one ever, no one has ever done it before or since. This was all by God's design. Alexander's conquest caused the rapid and thorough spread of Hellenism, the Greek culture. This culture permeated life everywhere, including Palestine. Hellenization was so extensive that for the next 600 years, from 300 B.C. to 300 A.D., saw Greek become the lingua franca of the Mediterranean world, which is a highly sophisticated language. I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a simple language, ask anyone who learns it. And it's a lifetime of trying to master it. Here's what's amazing, though. If you study the different languages, Hebrew, Hebrew is pictorial, perfect. Because in the Old Testament, we have allusions and foreshadowings and all of that, right? It's a very pictorial language. But when you get to the New Testament, it is precise. This is the, the revelation of fulfillment and consummation and completion. And therefore, everything has to be communicated with great precision. God set the stage, right, to bring his revelation to the world. So that when Paul and others would go around the world and they would bring the gospel, even Paul, when he would desire to head to Spain, he knew that when he got there, he could speak Greek and everyone would understand. And he would have scriptures that they would pass on through the churches. They copied and passed around that all would understand. It's amazing. <laughs> just, I mean, just think about how God moves the world. And yet in our own little lives, we just don't think that he can move the world, Right? But it's like, if I can move empires, I can raise them up and I can bring them down. Then he can do whatever we need him to do in our life. There's just no reason to doubt. 
This became the perfect medium in which God was going to give his revelation to the world as the apostles went out. Now the problem, this is the empire that, that Alexander left behind, but he left no one to sit upon the throne. He had no one who was old enough to take the throne after he passed away. And so his kingdom was going to be divided into four parts. And it was between four of his generals. And there was about 22 years of conflict that went on in the process. But here we have Cassander who took Macedonia. We have Lysimachus who took Thrace and Asia Minor. We have Seleucus who took Syria and Babylonia. And then we have Ptolemy who took Egypt and Arabia. The last two are the two that we're concerned with when it comes to New Testament history. They're the significant ones, but especially the Seleucids. They were extra zealous about Hellenizing the world. And so their influence, especially Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, and what he accomplished, we'll look at next week. But these are the four who are referred to as towards the four winds in chapter 8, verse 8. So all that Daniel prophesied, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, right? When we look from our perspective back in history, but okay, he was looking forward in history, right? To history that hadn't been written yet, although it was written by God beforehand, which is amazing, right? History is usually stuff of the past. We look back and we see the fulfillment of that, all right? If God was so precise in his fulfillment of that prophecy in history past, how accurate do you think he's going to be in the fulfillment of the, the millennial kingdom and all that is in the future? Right? We have no, no reason to doubt or question what God promises is going to come in the future. No reason. Because He's already fulfilled so much. Even to the tiny details of lumber and stones, right? That make land bridges for conquering peoples. So this is the empire as it's divided up. You'll find that the Seleucians and the Ptolemies have the greatest influence especially the Seleucids when it comes to Jerusalem. And we'll walk through and look at them next week and start to walk through some of the others, Hasmoneans and so on, and the, and the Roman Empire, and then we'll get into the religious realm and the different changes that happened there. But next week we'll come back and look at these. So the prophetic vision of the ram the, and the male goat, that elabor elaborates more fully on Greece. We'll look at it next week. And then also in chapter 11, we'll look at the prophecy there which has to do with the division of the kingdom and the influence. So the only thing we have added to our chart that I made up for you is the ram and the male goat. The ram is Medo-Persia, the male goat is Greece. And again, there's not much talked about in chapter 8 about Medo-Persia. They're out of the scene, and it's all about Greece. And then we have that, that period of Rome, and then we have a long Paranasis, which is the church age, which we are involved in and will continue. And then we have the revived Rome, and then the return of Christ. Any questions? Spelling corrections, comments?